They're like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. Yet these creatures are real, come to life in laboratories all over the world. The shape of things to come will resemble humans, animals, and some things we've never seen before, equipped with surprising capabilities, including a form of intelligence. By doing a task, the system noticing that it's not performed as well as it could, it can learn and change so that it does it better the next time. They adapt through practice. What are the secrets behind these technologies that are changing the world? And how will they transform our lives? Humans are going to be slowly reduced to providing human expertise. Everything else is going to be automated. Robots can do so much for us already, and they will do so much more in the future. Welcome to a new world where robots are among us, where artificial intelligence is our new ally, where vehicles have no human driver, and where the border between man and machine slowly disappears. AI and big data allows this kind of robot to be very logic and to make deduction and predictions. This world is our reality, and the future has already begun. Are you ready? In the 21st centuries, robots have left the factories and the labs. They are no longer confined to simple repetitive tasks. Today, these creatures of metal and plastic have permeated almost all areas of our lives. You can find them in the streets, in schools, in the heart of our homes, and even in concert halls. No longer considered simple tools, modern machines can collaborate with us and even communicate with us. We have entered the era of social robot. Despite their playful appearance, these little automatons are not just novelties. In the near future, they will participate with us in daily life. The most recent iteration has premiered in the United States. Hey, Timmy. Hello, John. It's called Temi and was launched onto the market with a considerable publicity campaign. Equipped with cameras, a LiDAR to map its environment and avoid obstacles, a screen and an intelligent communication system, it can recognize you. Come when you call it and can control connected devices in your house. And it can contact your loved ones with a simple voice command. At $2,000 a piece, it just may be your next domestic assistant. But the United States is not the only place where our new companions are kept busy. Assalamu alaikum. On the other side of the globe in Saudi Arabia, researchers have created the first robot capable of having a conversation in Arabic and understanding local dialects. How are you? I am fine. My first time at the Saudi Electronic University in Saudi Arabia. The goal? To use it as a receptionist in hotels or shops, and even as a teacher. The use of a robot with students has already been tested in classrooms in Finland. Repeat after me. Bear. Bear. Elias, a small humanoid robot 60 centimeters tall, 
can walk, talk, dance, and recognize the faces of children and their emotional states. Are you sad? No, I'm not. Oh, I was wrong. How are you feeling today then? I'm happy. That's great. <laughs> Remember the words? If a child is bored, Elias can offer fun activities like singing or dancing. Ice cream. He provides relaxation exercises if a child is tense or irritated. Kids appreciate this little teaching assistant who engages them through play and repetition. Robots at school? The idea seems completely improbable, and yet the results with students are promising. Robotics specialists are convinced these experiences will become a bigger part of our future. My name is Daniela Rus. I'm a roboticist, the director of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT, and a professor at MIT. There are activities in the classroom that require routine uh, interactions and those activities could be very well uh, delivered with machines. In fact, I believe that robots and studying robotics uh, is such an important aspect of 21st century education for a variety of reasons. Um, first, because I think that robots are magical to children and they just get excited about thinking about robots. And they really um, also, I believe, uh, like the idea of being able to control something when in fact they're being controlled all the time by the adults in their uh, environments. Elias, the small resident of the Finnish school, was designed by SoftBank Robotics, one of the largest robotics companies in the world. Its engineers have already designed many robots in their laboratories. But their new star is this one, Pepper. Bonjour. Salut. Ouais, salut. Et Moi aussi. Pepper is one of the first robots able to identify both faces and emotions and adapt its response to the person it communicates with. Je suis très gentil avec tous les humains. Ah, c'est bien. Today, the robot is already used to assist customers in shops, train stations, and museums. It is being tested in hospitals and retirement homes to help guide patients. Pepper is actually one of the first representatives of a new generation of companion robots. Small automated beings specifically developed to form relationships with humans. I am Alexander Mazel, Director of Innovations at SoftBank Robotics. What interests us most is moving towards long-term companions. In one of our scenarios, when I speak to the robot, I say hello. The next day when I see him, something will have changed in our contact. He will say hello, but it's not the same hello as today. That is to say that little by little, he adapted. He changed a little of his behavior according to what I told him. He's going to give me winks and things like that. I really believe in the robot Pepper as a companion for the elderly because we know we have this need to help people who crave conversation, human contact. I would say people with deep loneliness. We still have lots of things that are feasible, like adapting a little to the rhythm of a person's life. That is to say, the robot goes to bed at the same time as the elderly person and can also memorize the usual bedtime and offer a gentle reminder, say, you should go to bed now, usually you go to bed earlier. There are a lot of little things things like that that really make a difference, knowing there is someone in the room who can be of service, who can decide to bring a drink, render small services. The human-to-robot relationship could possibly resemble a human-to-human -human relationship. So much so that some scientists wish to go even further by developing machines with a nearly human appearance. How are you? 
I am a social companion. I can speak to their emotions and I can recognize people. This is Nadine, the latest generation in social robots, capable of recognizing its conversation partners, remembering past discussions, and analyzing emotions and starting a conversation. How many languages can you speak? I can speak in Hindi, English, Chinese, German, French, and Japanese. A robot made in the image of its designer, Nadia Thalman. I am Nadia Thalman. I am a roboticist in Miralab at University of Geneva. Nadine captures information from a face, and then this information goes to a, a big data set where it is detected which kind of emotion it is. Then it is analyzed through a model of emotions, and then Nadine behaves according to what she has understood. For example, if I say I'm sad, I have very bad news, she can analyze the speech and the intonation, but she can also analyze my emotion. And when she will answer, she will take a, a tone that is with compassion. And also what she will say is something that is also uh, relatively uh, neutral or sad. Do you have emotions? I do not feel emotions but I am programmed to simulate the full range of human emotions. I can be happy with a smile. You know myself, I am entering soon my third age, and I really like to have a person to take care of me. I know that it's not possible 24 hours. So in this case, particular case, I'm happy that a humanoid is able, like a human, to deal with me in a natural way. Nadine. Can you tell me a joke? Why shouldn't you write with a broken pencil? Because it's pointless. <laughs> thank you for the joke and thank you for the conversation. Like Pepper, and even more like Nadine, humanoid-shaped robots occupy a special place in the field of companion robots. According to certain experts, a human-like form is one of the keys to fully integrating companion robots into our daily lives. It's very important to have humanoid shape like humans because when we have an interaction with someone, it's always with a human. So I never speak to a box, I never speak as such as a cat, and I don't expect the intelligence too. We could put similar software with a box and a pet, but myself, I'm absolutely not motivated to live with a box or a pet that is intelligent because it doesn't correspond to to the natural interaction I have with humans. Es-tu un robot? Oui, je suis un robot humanoid. Today, people ask us, why is your robot better than a box with speakers? And for us, we try to emphasize the physical aspect, the fact that Pepper has a body. When a child is crying, you immediately want to take them into your arms. What interests us most is long-term companions, and that's what we want to explore in robotics. But this debate has divided the robotics community. Some experts believe that designing machines too close to our own image could provoke a feeling of rejection. My name is Auke Eispirt. I'm a bioroboticist, and I'm leading a biorobotics lab at EPFL in Lausanne, Switzerland. It should not be too lifelike, because then people find it creepy. It's called the uncanny valley. So maybe it's a bit more better than the face is a bit cartoon-like than too realistic. But indeed, uh, having eyes to look at, uh, having a, a, a mouse that moves, that, that probably is, is more engaging for interaction. So for that, clearly having a humanoid face, a bit more cartoon than realistic, I think can be very good. Alternatively, it could be a, a pet-like robot, maybe a little dog-like robot or something that you feel it's cute and, and is still there to assist you in some way. Companion robots in the form of pets? The idea has already occurred to some designers. In the south of England, the Templeman House Retirement Home has recently adopted a new artificial resident. His name is Biscuit, and he behaves like any little dog, and can interact with residents at any time of the day to provide comfort. Yes, you are a beautiful one. Yeah, that's lovely.
On the other side of the Atlantic, in Florida, Alzheimer's patients also connect with robotic animal companions. Studies have shown that it helps to reduce patient anxiety, as well as the use of psychotropic medicines and painkillers. Beyond these adorable robotic stuffed animals, the real animal world provides an unlimited source of ideas. And with the development of bio-inspired robots, we are now witnessing machines capable of faithfully reproducing animal movements and the ability to interact with their environment. The animal kingdom is so beautiful. You have so many morphologies for adapted for different uh, environments. It's really worth exploring all these different morphologies. Nature inspires and challenges us. Uh, nature has uh, achieved so much uh, in terms of movement, uh, in terms of uh, reasoning capabilities. Our machines are very simple as compared to what nature achieves, yet uh, we aspire to get as close to nature as we can. Today, scientists are able to reproduce the way animals move on land, underwater, and in the air. In Germany, Festo, a company specializing in automation, has developed a flying robot that mimics the aerial capabilities of a bat in every respect. Its wings are made of a thin elastic membrane and can be controlled separately by two small independent motors. With a wingspan of 2.28 meters and a weight of only 580 grams, this bat can navigate with the same dexterity as a real bat. For the time being, it still needs human assistance to take off and land. But it can fly autonomously in a defined space, thanks to its cameras and numerous onboard sensors. For now, these artificial creatures are mostly confined to laboratories. Only a few prototypes have been deployed in the field, but they have already demonstrated their usefulness. In the Netherlands, the Robird, a robot that mimics the flight of the Peregrine Falcon, was created. It is already being used in several airports around the world to avoid collisions by scaring birds away from aircraft. A new species of robotic animal has been born. Sophie is a soft robot. With its silicone tail, two motorized fins, and a propulsion system based on pumping and ejecting water, it can move and change speed and direction very smoothly, almost like a real fish. I wanted a robot that could not just sit there transmitting images of uh, underwater ecosystems, but a robot that could join an underwater ecosystem, a robot that could join a school of fish, um, a robot that could really help us peek into the secret lives of the underworld. 
And so we created SOFI, where SOFI stands for soft fish. Um, and this is a robot fish uh, whose tail is soft. Controlled remotely by a diver located approximately 20 meters away, Sophie can explore the heart of the coral reefs at close range, photographing the biodiversity without disturbing it thanks to the camera hidden in its nose. This fish has been an extraordinary experience because indeed we have been able to take the fish um, to uh, the ocean and our fish was able to swim side by side with real fish uh, without disturbing them. And the fish was able to collect uh, really uh, special um, images about the underwater world. I really believe that if we're going to have robots working side by side with people or working side by side in natural environments, those robots have to have bodies that fit with those environments, control systems that fit with those environments, and also modes of interaction uh, that are intuitive and um, fit very well. We still have a long way to go before we can produce the robots that integrate perfectly into their environment and help biologists. Nevertheless, like Sophie, some prototypes are already becoming valuable tools of science. Orobot, a replica of a giant 300 million year old lizard, the Orobotis pabsti. Scientists used the skeleton and fossilized footprints of the animal to bring this extinct species back to life. Here, uh, what we did is, is make a robot that exactly mimicked and replicated that morphology. And we wanted to answer this scientific question of what was the most likely gait, way of moving of that robot, especially since we knew the footprints. Following in the footsteps of its distant ancestor, Orobot allowed researchers to discover the locomotion of this prehistoric vertebrate. And interestingly, it was a fairly agile gait, fairly athletic, more closer to the caiman than to the salamander, for instance, so much more modern than we were thinking. In bioinspired robotics, people always think you, you, you need to take inspiration from biology and, and contribute to robotics. But I think there's a wonderful feedback loop where the robot becomes a very nice tool for biology in, in general. So I think a robot can be an interesting tool for studying biomechanics, how, how the body interacts with the environment, for paleontology, how previous animals were locomoting, or for neuroscience as a tool to test hypotheses, for instance, how the brain interacts with the environment. And I, I really love this concept of having a robot as a tool because, of course, many people use numerical simulations, do it in simulation, but once you have a robot and start interact, exploring the interaction of all the components, you really have a wonderful tool to very systematically and quantitatively test hypotheses. And still, robots continue to improve, moving ever more gracefully. exploring their environment. And even using tools. In many ways, machines are gradually learning to replace humans in specific activities. Some researchers are hoping to go even further. Their goal? to give these robots the ability to make their own decisions. Moving over challenging terrain is the primary job of these autonomous robots. The Centaur, this half-humanoid, half-quadruped robot inspired by the mythical creature, 
is one of the most recent examples of a rescue robot. It can grab and move objects with its two arms and navigate rough terrain on four legs. A fully autonomous version is still in the works, but it will soon be tested under real-life conditions in damaged buildings or factories, places too dangerous for human rescuers. But decision-making ability isn't just for humanoid robots, or even for bio-inspired ones. The next wave of thinking robots might just turn up in your garage. New generations of autonomous cars are loaded with sensors. Video cameras detect traffic lights, read signs, and even distinguish between pedestrians and bicycles. Radar and lasers pinpoint surrounding objects. LiDAR, a 3D mapping radar, collects data which is analyzed by onboard computers. Those computers will use increasingly sophisticated artificial intelligence. Flunky, awkward prototype cars that run on test tracks are a thing of the past. Driverless vehicles are about to merge into mainstream traffic, to the surprise of some experts. I'm Paul Rosenblum, a professor of computer science at the University of Southern California. I was shocked at how quickly we got from where it was almost impossible to get a computer to do a reasonable job driving a car to the point where we were talking about having them out on the streets. Um, that was something that just went enormously fast. Developments in the field of autonomous cars suggest we're on the road to a safer future where machines would eliminate human error. In this connected world, everything is designed to reduce the risk of road accidents to nearly zero. It will become safer because we will have robot cars connected with other robot cars and with human-driven cars. We may have sensors installed on buildings, on the infrastructure, so that even um, uh, the camera on the car cannot see what is happening around the corner. The car can talk to the camera installed at the corner and see that a child is about to run in the middle of an intersection and adjust to that. I just imagine how wonderful uh, it will be to have a world with no road accidents because our cars are so uh, aware of what is happening on the road that they will always avoid a road accident. And if you want to ride uh, uh, and drive your car, then maybe the autonomy system will be sort of like a, um, like a parallel autonomy system that will look over your shoulders uh, like a guardian angel and prevent you from making mistakes. Uh, even if you're a little bit distracted. A world without accidents, but also a world without traffic jams, because autonomous cars also offer large-scale solutions, something impossible to imagine with human drivers. With autonomous vehicles, uh, we hope we will manage uh, congestion uh, in ways that will ensure we're never stuck in traffic. Now, how to do that? Well, I think that requires a much broader view of what is happening in the transportation system. There are new types of algorithms that ensure we can control who goes where and when. These are called fleet management algorithms um, that will relieve a great um, traffic burden from our road networks. The ultra-dynamic field of autonomous vehicles doesn't stop at cars. Around the world, other means of transportation are currently being tested. In 
in Germany, after two years of research, engineers have managed to create the first 100% autonomous motorcycle. It can start, accelerate, drive in straight lines, make turns, and maintain its balance without any human intervention. In Sweden, a startup has just launched Teapot, a driverless truck seven meters long. Its cabin, which houses the electric motor, doesn't even need a windshield. It can transport up to 20 tons of cargo, drive independently, or be controlled remotely during more complex journeys. All right, so I've got a whole lap. Recently, its little brother, the T-Log, made its public debut. Specially designed for transporting wood, its cabin has been removed to facilitate very large tree trunks. Vehicles like T-Pod and T-Log may revolutionize the heavy goods vehicle sector, though the development of these autonomous trucks isn't limited to trucking. At this Norwegian airport, fleets of unmanned snowplows clear the runways. Operated in real time from the control tower, machines 20 meters long and 5.5 meters wide can clean 350,000 square meters in just one hour. It isn't just autonomous vehicles that are being developed. In the Netherlands, the first autonomous boat prototypes are in the testing phase. The goal? To transport passengers or goods on the Amsterdam canals. With their modular design, they can join to form floating bridges or platforms. But while all these autonomous modes of transport could soon become a regular sight on our roads and rivers, the question remains, can we trust them with our lives? A lot of the hard part in autonomous driving is, is the sensory processing. How do you interpret what's going on around you? Uh, and if you misinterpret it, you can make fatal mistakes. So a lot of the trouble there really is what kind of sensors are using, how accurate an image you can get of the world around you from those sensors, and therefore, are you making appropriate decisions given the true situation, not just the situation you think you're in. So you have to decide, for example, do I want to go left or right if I'm trying to go somewhere? So there's route planning, which is part of the big problem of intelligence. There are the hard ethical issues if you're in a dire situation and you have to decide whether to crash your car or run someone over. There are decisions about how cautious you're going to drive. Um, if the cars behind you are hard because you're going too slow and being too cautious, should you speed up? And so when people talk about true autonomous driving, you've got to deal with all of that. These questions are all the more crucial today as vehicles and other autonomous robots enter a new era. Deep learning. Expressiveness, so emotions. Head position if your head is going down. Hi, I'm Raffaello D'Andrea. 
I'm CEO and founder of Verity Studios, and I'm a professor at ETH Zurich. By doing a task, the system noticing that it's not performed as well as it could, it can learn and change so that it does it better the next time. Whether the learning takes place on the vehicle itself, whether that information is transferred to a uh, computing uh, station, whether it's to the cloud, and all of this information from any vehicles is shared to improve, um, it's really the system learns and adapts. Deep learning is rightfully the star of AI right now. They're generating huge successes. Um, based on the availability of lots of data and lots of computing and, and some improved algorithms. With deep learning, algorithms can process and classify data independently. They can learn and progress through experimentation just like human beings. The concept gets tested with this experiment on a small country road in England where a car will learn to drive on its own. At the start of the test, like a driving school teacher, a human driver straightens the wheels when the car deviates from its path. And the result speaks volumes. It took the teacher only 20 interventions before the car learned to follow the road. The car, equipped with three cameras on the roof and an onboard system, had not been previously programmed for autonomous driving. It learned to drive as any beginner would do. In the United States, a robotic hand undergoes an unprecedented exercise. It's instructed to rotate a cube until a certain letter shows on the top. As the experiment progressed, the hand accomplished its task faster and faster. improving its skill just like we humans learn to do by repeating action. Animal is a robot designed to inspect industrial sites as seen in this test performed on an oil platform. Inspired by how a dog moves, it can walk, run, climb stairs, and keep its balance. Or stand up in any circumstances, thanks to its fully rotating body. Equipped with 3D scanners, it analyzes its environment, can use its legs to interact with objects, and above all, learns from its errors. Over time, Animal becomes faster and more efficient. Today's machines can solve increasingly complex problems, but is there a limit? Will they ever be able to make appropriate decisions in changing situations? Can artificial intelligence ever develop common sense or resolve moral dilemmas? For experts, we may have reached the limits of what a machine can be trusted to do. The big challenge in all these situations is generalization. How can you extrapolate what you have learned uh, so far to new conditions that you have never seen? And there, having a human supervisor is still, I think, by law needed, and, and because that, that's, you can, a program can make big mistakes in extrapolation. And, and it's called this problem of, of overfitting. You learn too much on a sub-problem, and then that gives very bad solution for other problems. So this notion of generalization to, to all possible conditions is, is really, really tricky, as far as I know. You both have to understand your learning algorithms, understand the biases in your data, but you also have to add some protections. What we in humans would, cause common, would call common sense. 
So you don't just learn anything and you say, oh, that's what I learned in this situation, so I'm going to go with it. You bring your other knowledge to bear and say, is that appropriate? Is that reasonable? Uh, will something go wrong if I do it that way, even though that's sort of what this situation taught me? If we don't have learning computers to do that, then they're going to do some seriously bad things. The ethics of decision making are at the heart of artificial intelligence. But at the same time, the range of decisions made by machines continues to expand. In Australia, an underwater robot has received authorization to hunt and kill. RangerBot's mission is to identify a particular species of invasive coral-eating starfish and to inject it with a deadly poison. After two years of development, it carried out its first field tests in the heart of the coral reef. The results are promising. The robot detects the starfish with more than 99% accuracy. It could help to save the endangered Australian reef. But the RangerBot also poses an important ethical question. Can a robot decide to kill a living being? This notion of robots acting on the environment and possibly indeed uh, destroying part of the environment that we, f we feel is, 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 is dangerous is, is indeed tricky. Um, and the starfish example is, I think, very interesting. I think it's very good to protect the, uh, the coral reef and, and that. And in, in, in this case, I would suggest to have a human in the loop somehow, to not let the system completely independent, to, to really avoid big mistakes and start destroying things that we should not do. I would always suggest to have a human in the loop somehow, a human supervisor for all, all things where, where the robot is supposed to do something a bit dangerous to the environment. Likely what would happen is that, you know, let's say that this use case was successful with a person monitoring it, and after several years, you know, you try it autonomously, and then you, uh, you know, a person is supervising it, and then after enough time, people are comfortable that it works then once, you, once you're there, then maybe you can move to that level. But frankly, you know, why would you ever want to remove a person from that situation? You know, is, it, is it really that costly to have a person supervising that process? I think just from an ethical and um, uh, you know, moral perspective, I think it's always good to include people in the loop whenever you have something that is affecting life, whether it's human life or, or animal life. Morality and ethics are the domain of humans, not robots. Machines cannot be held responsible for their actions. It is up to us to set the limits to avoid lapses. Beyond these legitimate fears looms a larger question. While robots and artificial intelligence systems are becoming more efficient, will they eventually overtake us? AI is already proving to be much better than humans in certain areas, especially in data processing. Machines can recognize and categorize information faster and more efficiently than any human brain. They're a boon to industry and scientists. And one of the fields that benefits most from artificial intelligence is, of course, surveillance. Like this software capable of detecting a revolver on video surveillance images in a fraction of a second and alerting authorities.
parkour like this system developed by a British startup to counter cyber attacks. Mimicking the human immune system, it gradually learns to identify and defend against threats from hackers. It has already proven itself in British ports and in some power plants. Another area where artificial intelligence may be a game changer is in medical diagnosis. Researchers at the University of Oxford have developed Ultromics, software capable of identifying markers of heart disease on scanners. It can make a clear and reliable diagnosis in seconds, much faster than doctors. Will robots be the doctors and police of tomorrow? Does progress mean creating artificial beings more intelligent than ourselves? Do you use AI? I am using AI all the time to understand what you say, to generate answers, to recognize faces and emotions, for example. Wow. The answer is not unanimous. I don't know that we can build things that are a lot more intelligent than people in general. We know we can build specialized systems that can outperform people. Uh, whether it's now in games like chess and Go, or whether it's in, in other kinds of things. What we don't know is that it's possible to build general intelligence that is just much more powerful than people. And if I were betting, I would say, yeah, maybe a bit above. I mean, we can certainly do as best as the smartest human. Uh, how much smarter a, a machine can get, I really don't know at this point. I think robots will never be as good as humans in anything that requires a lot of imagination, art, clever thinking about design or construction of things. There uh, we have something special I think we will keep uh, for a long time of, of really being creative. And then I would say it will still take many years to get like a, a robot being able to play tennis like Roger Federer or playing football or climbing the Everest like a, a human. Humans and animals in general have locomotion skills that are so amazing, so it will take very, very many years to be able to replicate those. So I think there are some aspects where, as humans, we will still do better than robots for a long time. Today it's true that we often talk about our fear of robots, that we'll have super AI and be much more intelligent than humans and will take over, but in practice the most important use of robots is for repetitive simple tasks, like robots that pick up tree leaves from the ground. When we talk about education, they can repeat multiplication tables for hours and hours to children, and these tedious human tasks will have robots doing them. The question of the role that robots and artificial intelligence will play in our lives is not new. But the technological context is changing, making the issues and the stakes more and more crucial. Ultimately, it is up to us, humans, to choose carefully what we want to do with the machines we create. How far do we want to take them? And where will they take us? It is important to remember that robots, AI systems, machine learning systems are tools. They are tools by the people and for the people. They are extraordinary tools that can do so much. But like any other tools, they are not inherently good or bad. They are what we choose to do with them. And we can choose to do extraordinary things. But as we think about technology evolving, it is also very important to think about the consequences of our work. And I don't believe we can stop technology from expanding, but what we can do is to stop and think about the consequences and put in place the rules and regulations that ensure that the use is for the greater good.